Hi everybody, I'm Terry Stiles, and today we are recording on 9-11. We're recording the news on 9-11. And as we all know, this marks the 19th year in remembrance of the 9-11 devastation and sadness, but also we remember how the country came together and we honor every rescuer that was lost. Today, Oxford Fire Chief Pete Schultz carries on that tradition locally in honor of those firefighters by lifting, raising the, fr the flag. Welcome to Oxford News This Week. I am Terry Stiles alongside my coworker, Jim Hughes, and thank you for joining me, and thank you and Alexis for filling in for me last week. I appreciate that. No problem at all. Thank you, Terry. Hi, everybody. Great uh, to have you along with us on this day of remembrance. Oxford School Road returns the M24 construction update and wearing a mask while playing sports. All that and more, the Oxford News begins right now. The start of the new year has officially begun, and for Oxford schools, it's nearly 180 days off. Jill Lamont called the opening week an exciting success and acknowledged the change from early planning to now living it out. Lamont, the Director of Strategic Initiatives and Safety Operations for Oxford Community Schools, has been planning and organizing the COVID-19 preparedness and response plan around the clock in anticipation of the return of Oxford Public Schools. During this time, schools are running at 50% capacity with some students attending online versus in-person. Learning students are currently attending every other day, according to last name. The hard work from the school board has certainly shown, given the choices, students have currently 20 to 20 and 20 of 28 Oakland County's school districts have begun the school year fully remote with no in-person or hybrid options. Superintendent Tim Throne called the first week tremendous across the board and stated they couldn't have asked for anything more. Way to go, Oxford. After such a tough year, it's great to see this plan being so effective early on as the students return. Jim? As we near the five-month mark for the M24 construction project, the deadline appears to be falling a bit behind schedule. The original date of the completion was hoped to have been November 15th. This appears to be moving in the direction of being extended as crews have just begun to work on the west side of the highway. After the southbound traffic was shifted to the east side late last month, the shift will be in effect for the remainder of the construction project. MDOT engineer Brian Travis acknowledged the delay, stating the project is about three weeks behind. Travis is hopeful the shift in traffic will help buy back some time that was lost. If the construction is not finished by the deadline of November 15th, the goal is to continue working. Important to keep in mind weather conditions can always play a pivotal role while pay, uh, paving bearing no heavy snowfall. Travis went on to say the most important thing is to restore traffic on M24 in both directions before winter. Terry. In other news, recently the North Oakland VFW celebrated its 75th anniversary. The VFW, VFW has long standing in honor and improving the lives of veterans and serving the Oakland County community. The North Oakland VFW location also received a national recognition recently from the Veterans of Foreign Wars of the United States this past August. Over the years, the organization has placed strong emphasis on patriotism and passing values down to middle and high school students through their Voice of Democracy Scholarship program, which is an essay contest that awards nearly two and a half million dollars across the country annually. Truly a great organization and a pillar in the community. Congratulations to the North Oakland VFW for a wonderful 75 years. Jim? More details are making their way to the public regarding athletics in Michigan pertaining to the practices and the game action. Governor Gretchen Whitmer issued an order that clarifies the action taken this past week regarding organized high school sports. While most sports, including football, will be allowed to be played this fall, Athletes participating will not be required to wear a mask or face covering. The only exception being swimmers, divers, and certain athletes who can maintain six feet social distancing during sporting events. 
The Michigan Department of Health and Human Services has recommended against contact sports. However, they will be allowed to be played. The agency is urging athletes and students to avoid any activity that involves shouting, singing, or breathing forcefully near others. Important to note, as the past week, 1,000 plus games have been played. The high school football had zero reported cases of significant community threat following a high school game. This data is courtesy of the popular site footballscoop.com. Terry. Among the industries who have lobbied for the opportunity to reopen, Michigan gyms have continued to press the governor for a chance to be profitable once again, while also serving the community in terms of mental health and fitness. Last week they got their chance as Governor Whitmer allowed for the doors to be reopened with strict regulations. Among the requirements are the mandatory order for all members and staff to wear face coverings while maintaining six feet apart distance. Also, gyms cannot exceed a 25% capacity. So a little bit of good news, although not 100% back to normal, it's good to see our neighboring gyms opening up around the area and of course the state of Michigan. Jim? In a recent board meeting, a school board meeting, Oxford Schools current superintendent Tim Throne was granted an extension for the emergency powers for the duration of the 2021 school year. The extension will allow Throne the ability to waive board policies or take certain actions as needed to comply with the executive orders and the ability to respond to direction from health and government authorities related to COVID-19 issues. In addition to having the ability to waive the policy, Strong can also institute new policies or procedures to implement the executive orders and the school's COVID-19 preparedness plan, Terry. Well, that's it for Oxford News this week. If you'd like to learn more about these stories and others, you can pick up a copy of the Oxford leader newspaper, or you can go to the Chartered Township of Oxford Facebook page, or better yet, catch us on Charter Channel 191 or at t Channel 99, or our website at occtv.org. And we always thank you for watching Oxford News This Week and where we bring your news closer to home and some yeah. news that you might want to pay attention to mm -hmm. and maybe we'll get a little bit more about. Uh, yesterday's uh, press conference with Governor Whitmer, you know, mm -hmm. some people have different feelings on, you know, which, how she's been doing. Uh, but the state came up with a plan. Now, if you were an essential worker, and I mean that, mm -hmm. you know, that could be if you worked at a local store, whether yeah. you were a media person or obviously Grocery. hospital people, mm -hmm. uh, April 1 to June 30th is a 13-week mm -hmm. gap, period, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. If you, work 11, if you worked 11 of those 13 weeks, not 10, not 10 weeks, 4 days, mm -hmm. if you worked 11 weeks and can prove that on their website, wow. they are supplying money for people to go back to community college, or finish off their degree at university, or if your job requires some type of uh, license or certificate, mm -hmm, right. they're going to do that. I mean, I, I'm wow. sure we can get some more information about that. Yeah. Uh, go on the MichiganGov.Website, website, and there's a, it's a, it's a if you type in education, I think is what it is. I just thought it'd be something we should pass along because there was a lot of essential workers yeah, that right. are out there and that yeah. worked here and worked there. Yeah. that maybe you uh, might want to better yourself. So anyways. Oh, good. Maybe I can take advantage of that. Thank you for that. Um, I know that you looked it up when you went to the Michigan website. I did. Yes, I did. So it was easy to find. It wasn't something that's buried If I can find it, you can find it, right? <laughs> I didn't mean to say it like that. No, right? no, no. It's true. No, it is. I mean, I, I'm not computer savvy, okay? But yeah, it was easy to find. Again, I mean, they are pretty uh, stringent, in fact, of the 11 of the 13. I, I couldn't figure that out, and all of a sudden, like, a light bulb went on. They probably built in two weeks vacation time if anybody, oh, in, you see what I'm saying? So, right, 11 yeah, of 13. Yeah. Oh, good. So, okay. Well, anyways, really check it out. If um, you, know, you find out more information, get a hold of us again where we bring your news closer to home. For our uh, director in the back, Alex, who is running a great job with the yeah. uh, all the gear back there, right? Yeah, thank you, Alex. Carrie Styles, myself, Jimmy. As you go out, wear your mask when you can. Take yep. care of yourselves. We'll see you next week. You can't buy a best friend. You can love them, pet them, care for them, whether they want you to or not. You can take a picture. You can jump, yell. You can fly to the moon travel the world or just stay in bed you can't buy a best friend like that but you can adopt one Cause we're connected. 
Welcome to Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and these stories are taken from Automotive News. In our first story, General Motors has told most of its U.S. salaried employees that they should continue working remotely through June of 2021, stretching their work at home setup as long as 15 months. A significant number of employees have returned to their offices safely on a full-time or part-time basis, but the majority of GM's salaried workforce in the U.S. is still working remotely, spokesman David Caldwell said. GM joins other large corp corporations, including Amazon, Google, and crosstown rival Ford Motor Company, in allowing employees to work remotely into the next year during the coronavirus pandemic. Instead of instructing more employees to return to their offices soon, GM says salaried employees will continue to work as they are remotely on or on site. Our current outlook in the U.S. is to continue operating as we do today until June 30th, 2021. During this period, we're listening to feedback and working on the elements of a more flexible work culture, Caldwell said. Most GM salaried employees have been working remotely since mid-March when GM instructed them to stay home to curb the spread of the coronavirus. And on the recall front, Kia Motors America and Hyundai Motor America are recalling more than 600,000 vehicles because of the possibility of a leaking brake fluid that can lead to fires. The recalled U.S. vehicles are Kia Optima sedans from the 2013 to 2015 model years, Kia Sorento crossovers from 2014 to 2015, and Hyundai Santa Fe Sport crossovers from 2013 to 2015. The recall also includes 2013 to 2015 Santa Fe Sport crossovers in Canada, a spokesman from Hyundai told Automotive News. Brake fluid may leak into the hydraulic electronic control unit, which could cause an electrical short over time. An electrical short in the HECU increases the risk of an engine compartment fire. Kia will begin notifying dealers October 12th and owners starting October 15th. Dealers will inspect the control unit for leaking brake fluid and replace the component if necessary. Hyundai will begin notifying dealers and owners on October 23rd. Well, that's it for this edition of Auto Talk. I'm Dave Kenny, and we'll be right back. Welcome in to OCTV Sports this week. As always, I'm Dave Ciseski. The girls golf team is making noise early on this season, posting back-to-back -to -back top 10 finishes. The latest coming at the Troy Colts invite at Twin Lakes Golf Club. The tournament was limited to 72 golfers, which equals out to four per school with COVID-19 protocols in effect. Senior co-captain Janelle Gretsch led Oxford with an impressive 89, followed by freshman Kiara Billis, who had a 93. The girls team also finished sixth out of 15 in the Oakland County Division 11 tournament at the Lynx at Crystal Lake. An impressive showing also for Billis again as she broke 90 for the first time in her career with an 88. The varsity boys soccer team finished their first game this past week with a tie. The match was between University of Detroit Jesuit Cubs. Timely saves from senior goalkeeper Tristan Bennett kept the contest scoreless throughout. The match went back and forth all night. However, neither team was able to capitalize on a scoring chance. Football is back and kickoff will be this week against rival Lake Orion at 7 p.m. The opener will be the first for new head coach Zach Line. The Oxford native looks to take the program to new heights this season as the game will be the first of six regular season contests for the Wildcats. Important programming note, OCTV will be re-airing the game at 4 p.m. Monday courtesy of Lake Orion's ONTV. You can catch the game on Charter Channel 191, AT&T Channel 99, or our website at OCCTV.org. That's it for sports this week. As always, have a great day. We'll see you next week. Go Cats!
Welcome to Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny, and this story is taken from New Scientist. Hummingbirds can enter a hibernation-like state at night, dropping their body temperature to around 39 degrees Fahrenheit in an effort to preserve energy for use during the day. The birds are among the few animals, including the nighthawks and some small rodents, that are capable of torpor in which the body function reduces to a bare minimum for a few hours, says Blair Wolf at the University of New Mexico. Previous studies have found that hummingbirds can drop their body temperature from 104 degrees Fahrenheit to about 62 degrees at night. But now Wolf and his colleagues have found that some species can go much further, reaching 37.8 degrees Fahrenheit. You'd think they're frozen, he says. They feel like a cold rock. By day, the birds expend massive amounts of energy hovering while consuming nectar from 400 to 600 flowers. At night, they can reduce energy expenditures by up to 95%. Even their heart rate drops falling from 1,000 beats per minute to around 50, says Wolf. He and his team studied the species of hummingbirds thriving at about 4,000 meters above sea level in the Peruvian Andes. They trapped individuals overnight and inserted tiny probes into the cloaca to monitor body temperatures from evening to morning, including the 12 nighttime hours when the outdoor temperatures dropped to between 36 and 43 degrees Fahrenheit. Most of the birds, representing all six species, entered torpor in bouts lasting from 2 to almost 13 hours, says Wolf. Body temperatures varied, but it was the black metal tail species that came closest to outdoor temperatures, hitting a low of 37.8 degrees Fahrenheit. At around sunrise, the birds start quivering, increasing body temperatures by more than 1.8 degrees Fahrenheit per minute. Although reheating requires a lot of energy, the amount saved by going into torpor exceeded the cost. The team weighed the birds and found that those spending less time in torpor lost more weight, indicating they had used more energy in the night. Even so, torpor doesn't come without a price, says Wolf, as the birds' inert state makes them easy targets for predators. High up in the tropical Andes, however, it's a pretty predator-free environment, he says, and this is an adaptive strategy that works for them. Well, that's it for Science in the News. I'm Dave Kenny.